right. So welcome everyone to Straight Science. Um, Straight Science is a science evening presentation series put on by UAF Northwest Campus here in Nome, as well as UAF Alaska Sea Grant here in the work office tonight. And UAF Northwest Campus and UAF Alaska Sea Grant, we are public servants for the Bering Strait region and we serve the Bering Strait region, which is the homeland and waters of the Yupik, Inupiaq and Siberian Yupik peoples. And tonight's, um, tonight's speaker is pretty exciting to me. Um, Andy Mahoney is UAF and he is with the Geophysical Institute in Fairbanks where he's calling from tonight. And he is a sea ice scientist and he specializes in near shore sea ice. And tonight we're gonna to hear a little about sea ice movements. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> our sea ice movements have been um, quite rapid and um, impressive this year. So I think um, watching the ice go by has been something that we've wished was a little slower this year, uh, but maybe you can tell us a little something about that. I don't know. And um, so we're going to hear about up north, the sea ice radar that they have up north and how that's been useful. And it looks like we will be getting our own sea ice radar. So very exciting. Thank you all. And let's save our questions for Andy at the end of the presentation. Um, I will be monitoring the chat box. So feel free to go down to the bubble or the, at the bottom of your toolbar there and where there's a little bubble and it says chat, tap on that and um, type in, you can text in your question as well if you don't wanna talk. We do have a caller, callers will get preference. They are typically calling in from far away or outside of the Nome region and want to get on. So it is difficult to be a caller on a Zoom call and callers get preference. So with that, the caller, Know that you, if you want to unmute at any time and ask your question, you should go for it because we do have tenuous um, technolo technology in this part of the world where we may drop your call and all that. So you just feel free to, to ask your questions. I don't know if you'll have to hit star six or if you just unmute at your end, but you might have to figure that out. Um, you can also text me if you're not being uh, picked up and my text number if you have a pencil, is 907-434-1149. And we really appreciate all callers, as well as everyone else on this. With that, I'll turn it over to Andy Mahoney, and let's hear about sea ice radar coming to Nome. Thank you so much, Andy. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Gay. Uh, thank you for the, the invitation and the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing here with the sea ice group at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, particularly um, in, in the, the realm of sea ice radars. So uh, just to introduce um, the, the, the slide here, this is a photo taken from the roof of the bank building in Okiagvik. Uh, we're looking almost due north and uh, we have the radar there mounted on the right hand side and that's spinning around and giving us real-time data of the, the, the sea ice along the coast near Okiagvik, and we'll see a lot more of that um, in, in the rest of the talk. Uh, so to give a, um, uh, an, an outline, <clears throat> I'll start off talking, give an in introduction to coastal sea ice for anyone uh, not familiar with, with, with sea ice in the coastal zone or sea ice in general. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how a land-based radar works. Then I'll go into some specifics of the, the radar that we've been running in Opiagvik for uh, actually decades now. Um, and then I'll show off some of the, the data and animations that we've got with our radar up in Opiagvik before uh, talking a little bit more about what the radar in Nome might look like and where else we might be putting a radar in the near future. So uh, in the coastal zone, there are two main types of sea ice that you might find. Uh, the kind that perhaps you're most familiar with is, is landfast ice. So this is ice that remains attached to the coast. It, it's a platform that you can, you can walk from the beach and walk out onto the sea ice. 
so it can be a platform for hunting and traveling, and it can also protect the coast from coastal erosion and, and perform some other sort of services uh, along the coastline. Pack ice, on the other hand, is drifting. That's sort of the definition of pack ice, is that it's not landfast, it's moving around mostly under the influence of the wind and the currents. When the pack ice moves away from the shore, it creates uh, a floor lead either between the beach and the ice or between the landfast ice and the pack ice. And that floor lead is really ecologically important. It's a migratory pathway for marine mammals and shorebirds. And of course, it's where a lot of the uh, subsistence hunting that um, coastal communities along the Arctic coastline, uh, they, they go to the lead edge for, for a lot of their hunting, uh, particularly the, the whaling up in Okiagvik. Um, but when the pack ice comes inshore, it can close that lead and then you can have interaction between the moving pack ice and the fast ice that can deform the fast ice or sometimes even get pushed up on land and, and the ice can ride up um, on the land as well. So in the, the, the data and videos that we're going to be looking at, we're going to see both land fast ice and pack ice. And so how do we detect that with a radar? I mean, it, it, it turns out to be pretty simple. Sea ice is a natural reflector of radar energy, provided that it's rough enough. And so when you mount a radar at the beach or, or on a building, you can see the parts of the ice that are rough. And so this sketch shows that if you have a rubble field um, where you have blocks of broken ice, that, that will get picked up nicely by the radar. Pressure ridges, they stand out really clearly. And if there's an edge of a flow sticking up above the waterline, that will also catch the radar data pretty well. But open water and smooth ice surfaces will often look the same. They, they kind of look dark or black in the radar image. And tall pressure ridges can actually create a shadow zone where you don't see anything behind a tall ridge. And so in the animations that follow, uh, in, in, in the radar data that we're going to be looking at, uh, just sort of try to remember that what we're seeing is the rough ice. And if we don't see anything, that might not mean that there's not ice there. It might just mean that the ice is smooth or it might be shadowed by a, a, a tall ridge or something. Um, and then we'll also see clouds and rain in, in the radar data. And sometimes we'll see some wildlife. And we'll take a look at that in, in the slides coming up as well. Um, one thing that people often comment on is that the radar provides, it looks like a satellite image. Uh, how does something on the ground produce an image that looks like a satellite image? And radar um, works in this way that it, it sweeps around and so it gets a complete view of its surroundings. And every time it gets a reflection from some, from some target, from some chunk of ice sticking up, it knows the direction it's looking in and it knows how far away it is. And that's what radar stands for. It's radio, direction, and ranging. Um, I think the word radar is used so often that people forget that it's an acronym, but that's what it stands for, radio, direction, and ranging. And so if we know the range and direction to an object, then we can sort of put that on, on a map of our surroundings. And what we build up is an image that kind of looks like a bird's eye view from a satellite, but is actually generated from a, uh, an instrument on the ground that, that, that's turning around. So hopefully we know a little bit more about sea ice now and a little bit about radar. So now, now it, it's time to start looking at what uh, sea ice looks like in a radar image. Um, so here's a, a short animation taken from Okiagvik. So this is northernmost Alaska um, with a, a sea ice radar. And this was some data going back actually 10 years now to uh, 2012. The image, the, the radar antenna is rotating every two seconds, but we're just keeping one image every four minutes. And so at the bottom corner of the animation here, you can see the, the minutes counting by uh, flickering past. So th this is obviously a lot faster than, than real time that we're watching this animation at. And that's gonna be the same for all the animations that we see coming up next. On this occasion, we had the radar set on a 12 mile setting so we could see potentially things that were 12 miles away. Um, but it turns out 
the, the, the physics of it work out so that we're only really seeing <clears throat> about seven and a half miles. And, and so for everything else that we're going to see in, in the rest of the slideshow, uh, we're going to be seeing things just at the six mile range setting. Um, and, and that'll be, uh, there'll, there'll be a scale bar and everything so you can uh, see what's going on. So what we're looking at here is the rough bits of the ice that the radar can detect in the ocean. And you can see those are moving around and shifting. But then on land, we're also seeing buildings and uh, pipelines and snow fences that also make very good uh, reflectors for, for radar energy. And at the very edge of the range, uh, almost 12 miles out, it's about 11 and a half miles away, there was one pressure ridge that we were able to see consistently. We actually went and checked out that pressure ridge later in the year, and it turned out to be a very, very big ridge indeed. So we can sometimes see sea ice far away if it's, if it's a tall enough piece of ice. So we've actually been running uh, a radar in Okayagvik um, not continuously, but since the 1970s, the, the first sea ice radar that was installed um, by Lou Shapiro and others here at University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, watched the ice from 1973 to 1979. And they had very uh, different technology compared to what we're using now, but they basically achieved exactly the same thing. They had a camera a 35 millimeter camera taking a photo of the radar screen with a, with a time lapse mechanism. And then they played that time lapse as a movie and then they watched the, the, um, the ice go by. We're doing effectively the same thing now, only everything's digital. And, and incrementally over a series of, we're now on the, the Mark VI version of the radar in Nokiagvik. Um, we, we, we have the, the best data quality and, and, and the, uh, uh, the most reliable system to date. And I'm going to be showing you images and data coming up in the rest of the slideshow that are from the Mark V and Mark VI versions of the radar uh, from 2012 onwards. So the, the, the current coastal sea ice radar in Okayagpik is located on the bank building, and that was uh, the, the roof of the bank building that I showed you on the, on the title slide. Um, we've got a latitude, longitude for anyone who's interested in that. We're about 20 meters above sea level, that's 60 feet. And we can see effectively about 11 kilometers or six nautical miles. Um, and this newest version is equipped with some uh, additional software processing after we get the radar data uh, that allows us to get much better image quality. And, and that's a, a off the shelf system um, from Furuno. And this is exactly the same system that we're gonna be deploying in Gnome. Uh, if you want to see real time data from this system, uh, here is the website. This is actually a screenshot I took of the website um, just, uh, I guess just about an hour and a half ago. Uh, so the, this is actually fairly recent images. Uh, you can go to the website to see the real-time data. The image on the left is updated every five minutes, and there's an animation on the right that shows the last 24 hours of data, and uh, that's updated every hour. And here's an example of what some of the animations can look like. This is actually data from 2013 in November, capturing some of the early uh, periods of formation of the, the shore fast ice. And so in this example, you can see that there's a little bit of shore fast ice attached to the coast, but most of what the radar is seeing is, is pack ice, it's ice drifting. And you can see that the radar catches some pretty complex ice motion. Uh, during this pretty short time interval, I think it's just less than 24 hours, we see a, a, a rapid reversal with the ice initially moving down to the Southwest. And then uh, a sort of a, a jet-like, uh, reversal in the current direction as uh, the ice abruptly changes direction right, right in front of uh, the, the, the town of, of Barrow. And this is pretty typical conditions for early in the season with a little bit of ice that's attached to the coast that may or, or may not stay attached for the rest of the season. If we jump ahead in the season a little bit, this is now uh, 
an example of what the ice might look like in January. Now we can see there's a lot more ice in the picture. Most of what of the radar view is taken up by ice and it's just piling up against the coast. And, and this is one of the ways in which land fast ice is, is added to the coastline. It's kind of an accretionary event where new ice just gets piled up and ridged. And when the ice opens up and moves away again, there's a little bit more land fast ice left against the coast than there was beforehand. And so th th this is an example of ice coming up against the coast, probably under westerly winds in, in the case of Ochiagbik. Um, at the other end of the season, during summer, this uh, is a pretty dramatic example of the, the breakup of the shore fast ice at the end of the year. If you look near the coastline, you can see there's already ice starting to move in a, in a moat that's formed between the beach and the land fast ice. And now the land fast ice breaks away from the coast. And as it does so, it just disintegrates into thousands of, of smaller and smaller ice chunks. Um, and there's a lot of really useful information here. Uh, scientifically, we can understand what causes land fast ice to break up. Um, but from a, a sort of a community information point of view, um, we, we can provide information on, on what's happening in real time with the ice, if perhaps there was anyone uh, on the ice at that time or planning to be. We can use the time series from the radar to calculate the ice velocity. And, and once again, we can do this in, in real time. So here's an example of a radar image with the ice velocities uh, for the last 10 minutes or so calculated on top of that. The length of the arrow corresponds to the speed with which the ice was moving. Um, these numbers are in meters per second. And if you roughly multiply by two, then you get the speed in knots. And so some of the fastest ice we're seeing in this image is actually moving at about one and a half meters a second or about three knots. And I mentioned the possibility of using these data for uh, community information in the event uh, that there was a breakout with people on the ice. And that, that was a little bit of foreshadowing on my part because this next animation shows the breakout of a piece of sea ice a piece of land fast ice from the coast near Okiagvik in 2014. And there were uh, people, there were some whaling, members of whaling teams uh, on the ice that just broke away. Uh, fortunately, they were still on the ice uh, when it started to come back in and they were able to be rescued by boats that were launched uh, from the, the newly opened up edge of the shore fast ice near the beach. Uh, and in this occasion, the radar data was actually used by the local search and rescue team, the volunteer search and rescue team in Okiagbik. Um, and during the event, we were trying to coordinate with them to provide them the most up-to-date uh, data as, as, as possible. Um, at the time, the winds were too strong and the visibility was too bad to launch a helicopter. And so we have been told that the, the data from the radar turned out to be really helpful to the crews going out into, in a boat into these conditions. And happily, all the people and gear were, were safely recovered during this event. We are also now working on a method to try and detect breakout events, not just after they've happened and, and, and calculate where the ice has gone, but actually trying to work out an early warning system that can possibly detect an event a breakout event before it happens. So in the image that I'm about, or the animation I'm about to start, we are running a process that color codes the pixels if it detects any movement or change in that pixel. And if it's red, that means that there's been motion or change in the last 30 minutes. If it's yellow, motion or change within the last half, uh, last three hours. And if it's blue, there's been motion or change within the last 12 hours. And if it's gray, like most of the pixels are at the, uh, the screen we're looking at now, that means that nothing has happened uh, that the radar has detected in the last 12 hours. So if I play this animation now, you'll see that very abruptly, 
it turns red and moves away. Uh, and I'll let this play a few times because if you notice, it turns red before we start to see it moving. And that's the critical part of where we might be able to use this as a early warning system. Now, this phenomena, which we're calling flickering, was actually first observed by that radar that was run in Upjavik in the 1970s. Um, and I think this is just sort of an indication of how long it takes science sometimes to, to really start to understand what's going on and, and learn how to, uh, what to do with information like this. So I'm hoping that we can implement this in a way that will be useful to communities so they'll get early warning, but of course, without leading to, to too many false alarms or anything like that. Um, and so this next slide just summarizes what we saw. At 0400 in the morning on January 23rd, the first time that we saw any evidence of red pixels, that's like pixels that are just starting to change and move. Um, by eight minutes later, by 0408, it was very, very clear that that bit of ice was uh, flickering and moving while the rest of the ice wasn't. Um, almost half an hour later is the first time that we see any real sign of movement and, and, and an identifiable crack forming in the radar data. And that's a crack that's going to be about 25 to 50 meters or, or 75 to 150 feet, 75 feet to 150 feet across. Um, and then by five o'clock, the crack had opened significantly uh, hundreds of feet across. And, and, and you know, so that then becomes a real problem if you had to try and cross, cross that uh, crack with, without a boat or, or something. Um, this way of color coding the images is also, I think, leading to new insights, new scientific insights into the mechanics of how ice behaves as a, a granular material. Um, in this animation, you can see that different parts of the ice are lighting up at different times. And that tells us that the, the stress and strain isn't being experienced everywhere in the ice at the same time. It tells us that there are specific pathways that stress and strain are following as the ice moves around and, and jostles up against the coast. And this sort of information is what we need if we want to be able to model this sort of thing in a, in a computer model accurately so that we can have better climate forecasts or perhaps even predict uh, breakout events like this uh, before they happen, um, not just based on a radar, but by, by other observations as well. And it turns out, I kind of hinted at this earlier, but you can also see wildlife in, in the radar too. Here's a little zoom in on uh, some of the tundra just outside Okliagvik. And if you look at the area to the south of, of the letters of Okliagvik, you can see uh, little trails dancing around. Um, they're moving, so they show up as red in this color-coded image. And uh, we have determined that these are uh, groups of caribou um, moving around and sometimes you see them all scatter because there's been some disturbance. Uh, so I, I believe we might be able to convince caribou biologists that um, there's, there's use in, in uh, these radar data for, for tracking caribou herds as well. We also see birds show up and, and bird detection by radar is uh, a, a very well established science. Um, and, and we do sometimes see those, particularly at this time of year, following the lead edge uh, flocks of, of, of ducks and geese going by. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, and, and as uh, Gay mentioned in, in the introduction, our next radar that we're planning to deploy is uh, in Nome. Um, we have, with, with the help of the, the mayor's office, identified uh, a light pole down on the, the, the west jetty of, of the dock, uh, of, of the harbor. And I have photoshopped <laughs> a picture of the Opiagvik radar on top of that light pole to give an idea of, of what that's going to look like. Um, we should have, I believe this is going to have an elevation of around 60 feet above uh, the surrounding sea level. And so that's going to give us a, a range comparable to what we can see in Okiegbik, 
And this is what a six nautical mile range around that location is going to look like. Um, I've drawn this on a Landsat image, a satellite image from March 12th, showing the, the, the land fast ice that you guys had uh, a couple months ago in Upayagvik. And so I think we're going to get a real good view of the shore fast ice and the pack ice beyond when we, we get this radar operational, uh, which, as I said on the last slide, will hopefully be um, by the end of June. And we have a total of five radars that we are planning to deploy. We already have one in Opiagvik. The GNOME radar is sitting here uh, packed up and ready to go in Fairbanks. And we've got three more that we'd like to deploy uh, over what's left of this year and going into next year. Uh, lots of options. I have just put some dots on a map where there are communities in uh, along the Alaska coast. Um, any one of these, I think, could be a really interesting place to put a radar. And we'd really like to work with local communities who are interested in having one so that um, we find the best place to put it. We understand what community needs are in, in, in terms of uh, what information they might want from this radar, how we can install it in a way that won't produce any, um, won't interfere with anything. Uh, and basically each radar just needs electrical power, um, internet access, which potentially we could set up our own satellite internet uh, and elevation. We need to be around about 60 feet above sea level if we're gonna be able to see um, six nautical miles. And, uh, and that's actually what the range, the, the size of these yellow dots on the map is, is set to be that. If we can find somewhere with a bit more elevation, then we should be able to see a bit further. So if anyone uh, listening or, or perhaps watching this video later on uh, has a recommendation for where they would like to see uh, a CS radar, uh, please, please get in touch. Um, and so with that, I, I, I blitzed through those animations pretty quickly. If anyone wants to see an animation again, please let me know if there are any other questions. I guess we've hopefully got lots of time for questions now, or if you're watching the video, uh, here's my contact information. Drop me an email, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and then just to acknowledge that this work is funded as part of the Integrated Systems for Operation in the Polar Seas project, which is funded through the Department of the Army. And we're really grateful for assistance from the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation and the Arctic Slope Telephone Association Cooperative in Okiagvik for their support of the Okiagvik radar. And we're really grateful to the city of Nome for their help so far in helping us identify uh, a location to put the Nome radar next month. All right, thank you so much, Andy. That was really interesting. I know I have questions and, um, but your first one, first off is the uh, caller. Let's see if the caller, feel free caller to unmute yourself and uh, ask away at any time, because I know it is hard to be a caller. And in this region with the true digital divide we have in the Bering Strait region, um, we're glad you're on. You also have a first question in the chat on slide 11. Rick Toman has a question for you. Okay, let me go back to slide 11 here. Thanks, Eric, Andy. This is really, really interesting. Um, so um, in, the, in the learn something new every day department, um, so uh, before uh, your presentation here, I would have guessed that um, that very dark area there, um, several miles uh, northwest of the coast was open water, but now, given it's January 9th, that could well just be smooth ice. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Um, here, I'll actually play the animation. Um, and, and it becomes more obvious what's ice and what's open water when you play the animation. If, if there's an area that's dark that closes up easily, it was probably just open water. But if you see an, an area that's dark and it behaves more as a rigid body, then that was probably uh, thin ice. So if you can see my mouse, this region here where my mouse is hovering, mm -hmm. 
that looked like an area that was kind of holding its shape. And so that was probably some, some thin, smooth ice that was moving past the coast. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate that explanation. All right, and Dean Stockwell, you did have your hand up earlier. I don't know if, and it's come down. Yeah, I was wondering if there was any way to couple your sea ice imagery with regional wind data, because you you can have wind blowing across the area, not really affecting the ice until it hits a threshold and starts to move it. And I was wondering if you were looking at correlations when these breakout events take place, if all of a sudden the wind's at 15 knots, you see the separation. Um, that, 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 that's a great question. And certainly I think to really understand what's going on sometimes we do have to do a, a bit more homework and, and then look at the wind conditions. Sometimes we've actually had a mooring uh, that gives us the currents under the ice as well. Um, and, and that can be really uh, educational. And what we found is that, uh, and I'm actually, I'm gonna tell my, uh, ask my technician, Josh Jones, uh, he, he did his master's degree looking at these data as well. And um, he might be able to jump in for me here, but I think about a quarter of the time we see that the ice is moving against the wind. And so that tells us that the current in at least here in Okayagvik is really important in, in driving ice motion, not just the wind. Wow, yeah. because, because I, I, I think of these strong easterlies and westerlies coming along that coast, either pushing the ice out or, or, or not. And, you know, you, you have these three areas, you have your pack ice and you have your fast ice, but you all have, also have that very volatile stamuki zone, mm -hmm. kind of broken stuff. And I was just kind of curious, you know, I agree with you that the dominant currents are probably coming up from the south to the east on the, all of these images, but those wind dynamics must just be phenomenal up there. And uh, I was just wondering if you, you're trying to correlate all of the, the wind, uh, various satellite imagery you do get with, with your, fat, with your uh, ice radar. It, it's good stuff, I like it. Thank you. Yep. All right, thank you, Dean. Thanks, Andy. Um, and by the way, for people who are, I forgot to mention, it is not easy to be a straight science speaker. And I think, Andy, you kind of um, um, finished up before I was sort of ready. And I would say for everyone who's been listening in, throw some Andy some love. He took some time out of his day to make this presentation and give it to us. So um, thank you, Andy, for that. And people, it's always nice. Give Andy some love for, for hooking us in with what he is doing. This is a new topic to me, honestly, the sea ice radar and known. So um, okay. the question, hang on, Rob, I see your hand, but we'll zip down to the chat box. Have you been able to do any outreach to Bering Strait communities to find out which may be interested in radar? Um, Good question. Yeah, it, it's a great question. We have reached out to um, uh, Kuwerik and uh, the No Meskimo uh, uh, Commission. Um, uh, and, and honestly, we haven't got a tremendous amount of interest back yet. Uh, and so that was one reason that I was, when, when Gay asked me if I would do this uh, straight science, um, she really didn't have to twist my arm very hard. Uh, I, I think this is an excellent outreach series and um, I'm hoping that this will at least be part of our, our effort to, to reach out to communities and get that sort of feedback. If anyone else has any specific recommendations on how to reach out more effectively, um, we're, we're all ears here. Uh, again, my, my email was on the, the last slide um, or uh, obviously more than happy to hear any suggestions now. Well, thank you. And that was a good question. And thank you, Andy, for your honest answer. And, and of course, I'm going to ask you to stay, you know, whenever, when we finish off, um, why don't you stay and we can, we can talk a little longer about some of that. That might be a good thing. Um, and anyone else can get in contact with Andy as well. 
And I think he had, you might want to put your contact information slide up. Um, just Good idea, yeah. All right. And um, Rob Kaler has his hand up. Hi, Rob. Hello, uh, great presentation. So asking kind of from the use of, of marine band radar for wildlife monitoring, I'm, I'm a seabird person. So mm. a couple of thoughts. I think little diomede might be a really interesting. I didn't see any any dots on little diomede, but and I, I, I you might have some challenges with that. internet out there. So bring us bring your satellite uh, internet with you, I guess. Yeah, uh, I would love to. Put, unfortunately, the other things covered the whole island. That was why I didn't put. Right. Yes. Exactly. Uh, one on each side. Um, and then differences between X band and S band. You didn't really touch on that. And, and I guess maybe I was a little curious. And then. Um, and bang for the buck, perhaps um, helping monitor activity of birds. So pointing out like at Uptiavik and birds moving past, um, since you're already there, maybe matching up with some researchers that are just interested in, in those movements. I know it's very hard to get it to species, um, but um, that presence. And, and I think about this for auklets at Little Diomede, where we have clouds of these birds and not really well studied. And then of course, all the vessel traffic. So. But um, really cool, and I'll definitely, I've screen captured your, your email address and happy to follow up with you. Oh, great. So um, wonderful presentation. Thanks very much. That was a lot of kind of vomiting, a lot of information there too. But um, anyways, thanks very much. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, I guess, was there, was there a question there? I mean, I can talk about why we- The X-band and S-band, I guess, in particular, and how, um, yeah, if there might be an opportunity to loop in more of the, the animal component and, and mm -hmm. isn't, as a complement to what you're already doing. So once you put the infrastructure in for the for the um, the marine band radar, if you might, you know, if you're only doing X, you know, add an S band if that's better for birds, that kind of thing. Just more bang for the buck. Is that even an option? Uh, yeah. So, so we at the moment, Furuno are only offering. They've got a. a sort of an extra package that you can buy that does some additional processing to the radar data in real time that makes it better at detecting ice. And they're only offering that at the X-band models at the moment. So that, that was honestly our primary reason for going uh, with X-band. Um, both X and S, uh, for, for those um, not familiar, it refers to the length of the, the, the wavelength of the radar that you're using. Um, and, and, and the length of the radar determines the uh, how sensitive it is to different types of, of, of roughness and, and X band and S band are both sensitive to the kinds of roughness that you get on sea ice. Um, and that's why they're, they're both commonly used. Uh, but we're using X band partly because that, that was what was available in an off the shelf system. And, and we're, we're trying to go off the shelf as much as possible because it, it just makes our life a lot easier. Um, as for the bird detection, we'd certainly love to work with, with other researchers. Um, the data volume is pretty large, so we'd have to find a way to sort of automatically detect birds um, so that we could produce data that was kind of useful without having to sit through hours and hours of, of, of radar animations. But um, that, that, I think, could be a really interesting science project in of itself. And maybe one more question. How mobile can these units be? Um, we haven't really experimented with that. Uh, they've got to be... If you're going to look at the ice, you need elevation. So if, if there isn't like a building or a hilltop nearby, then you've got to set up a tower and, and that makes it less mobile. Uh, and then the other aspect is the, 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 the power requirement. Um, these draw, we're talking hundreds of watts. So uh, you, you'd need to have some kind of way of generating power uh, if, you weren't, uh, if you didn't have access to AC grid power. Thanks very much. Great presentation. All right. And thank you, uh, Rob and Andy. Rick Toman, your hand is back up. Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, just thinking about um, this, Andy, um, I would be uh, curious to hear your, um, maybe your, uh, your science hypotheses on differences you might expect between the kinds of information uh, and what we're learning about sea ice from the Utkiagvik radar versus um, what we might get in the very different ice regime um, for Nome. Um, any thoughts on that? 
Um, my main thought is I am really interested to see what we see. Uh, I know little enough about the GNOME CS environment, or I know just about enough to know that what I know from other places in the Arctic, uh, okay, lots of places in Alaska and Canada and Greenland, aren't going to translate directly to GNOME. So I think we are looking at quite a different um, CS environment. From what I've seen looking at satellite, I've only been on the fast ice in GNOME once and we didn't venture very far out. And from what I've seen in satellite images, I think it forms by largely similar processes, uh, interaction between the drifting pack ice and, and, and the land fast ice. So I think we're gonna see quite a bit of the same stuff, uh, but more, more mobile. Um, uh, I suspect events that we only see happening once or twice a year up in Upbeagwick in terms of breakout events and so on, uh, we're probably gonna see more often in, in GNOME. And so that might make it a better laboratory for trying to figure out what it is that causes a breakout event. If we're just gonna see that many more of them and get that many more observations. Okay, great. Thank that, oh, thank you, Rick. The fact that your tower, or the light pole, you're gonna be at the terminus of a freshwater river might make it very different. Uh, yeah, actually, um, does that river overflow onto the top of the ice at all? Do, do, is, is there overflow in the springtime ever? Because I'm actually intrigued to know what that looks like in radar. I think that might be a really good way to detect and map that event. You'll see all manner of things when we get a big southerly storm from the south and it goes and the water level here rises quite quickly because we're so shallow and we may have ice in the port itself and then you get a storm surge of eight feet well that's actually that is a really big difference then uh, the, yeah. the magnitude of the of the, the 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 sea level variations from storm and tides um i i suspect we're going to see a lot more tidal activity with with the radar too and i'd be interested to know how that how it is that we see that that might result in 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 sort of twice a day we see a lot of flickering in the radar image or, or something like that so um yeah uh, I'm, I'm i'm interested to see what we see i'm, I'm right. a bit of a novice honestly when it comes to sea ice south of bering strait all right well you're in the right place you'll be surrounded by people who who are not so that'll be good you can get lots of information from um communicating with people in the region it'll be it'll be very very useful um peter you have your hand up thank you so much yeah, um, that was really, really interesting. I um, I used to work in disaster management, and so I'm particularly interested in the early warning systems that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. And then putting on my reporter hat, um, would you like me to put your email at the bottom of an article in the paper so that people, if any, if anyone in any of the village reads it and say, oh, maybe we could do that too. Can, can we do that? Um, uh, yes, absolutely. Please uh, share my email in, in, in whatever form, in, in, a, in a, an article in the Gnome Nugget or uh, however else. I'm more than happy to be uh, to, to, to speak to people in the villages, particularly south of the Bering Strait, who know more about that ice than I do, um, or have any thoughts on how, what, what things they might like warning of that a radar might be able to detect. So, so there are a few, we've been working on this idea of early warnings uh, from the radar for, for a while. And there's a few different sorts of event we think we might be able to detect that I, I, I showed the, the, the early warning for a breakout event uh, in this animation, in, in, in this presentation. Um, uh, another hazard that's caught people out uh, in summertime in Okiagvik is uh, the, the rapid encroachment of ice against the coastline. So there was open water and people were out in boats. And then that ice, uh, that water closes up suddenly when, when the ice comes in. Um, so I think that's another event that we would be able to detect and then write some software that would allow us to send out some sort of warning in that event. Um, getting into sort of official warning systems like tsunami warning systems and things, uh, if you're trying to actually work with state state run uh, state big state or um, you know, federal law or state of Alaska or something um, 
there's a lot more hoop to jump through and and, and I think uh, legal uh, considerations that we're not ready to get into that conversation yet that this is still sort of very much at the scientific development level um, but it would help us get to there get to that step if we knew what sort of hazards people wanted warning of and and then we can look at how how reliably we can detect those with this system super interesting thanks very much all right there is a question and sorry metcalfs i i scrolled too fast and i had to go back um wondering if the radar can detect wave swells impacting the pack ice um wow that is a a, a great question that, that's actually one of my little uh um favorite bits of research that we're doing at the moment is looking at waves and, and how they're interacting with sea ice um so yes we do think we can detect them and that's actually one of our leading ideas uh, as to what causes this this flickering that i that i mentioned that the the, the radar image in places appears the the, the the sea ice isn't moving, but it's just sort of uh, changing over time, uh, giving this sort of flickering appearance in, in the animation. And we think that's possibly caused by waves uh, propagating uh, in, into the ice and, and causing it to move back and forth. And that causes the, the signal strength to, to increase and decrease in, in the radar image. Um, We've actually currently, actually no, we've just taken them all in. We had some wave buoys on the shore fast ice in Upkiagbek uh, that we just had taken off the ice uh, before um, it, it got too hazardous for them. And I haven't downloaded the data yet, but really interested to see if we see any uh, evidence of waves penetrating the swell with these wave buoys. Uh, but we should be able to see it with the radar. We hope to be able to see it with these buoys, but that, that is an area of, of active research right now. Great question. Thanks. All right. Um, any Peter, your hand is still up. Do you have another question? Nope. Sorry, just left it up by accident. Oh, okay. Dean, go ahead. Hey, Andy, you got me going here. So, um, is there any way that you can couple your motion data with sea ice thickness? And I know a lot of other people that have radar units use multiple units kind of to, to get a more accurate picture of, of ice motion. And I guess, I guess where I'm coming from is if you threw out some transponders, radar transponders out there, would it help your diagnostics at all? Um, I'm not sure. We've played around putting reflectors on the ice. So, so yeah. radar reflectors um like sailboats use to to make them more visible to, to larger ships with radars um and we found that actually the uh the, the cs itself is a good enough reflector that we don't need uh, a rate a reflector on it an artificial reflector a transponder might be helpful for tracking ice um so a transponder is something that receives uh, the the energy from from the coastal radar and then would broadcast its own uh, signal back um, and and that actually might be useful for tracking ice that's outside the normal range of 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 the sea ice radar so so that actually could be helpful for understanding what's happening outside with with outside the range for ice that we can't see to help us uh, understand like this ice that came in is that because ice you know a lot, a lot farther away was also sort of all moving in the same direction towards the shore or something and, and if, if, oh, sorry, go on. if you had another station close to Nome, how far would that have to be? Like the Diomedes, or I, I don't have a feel for the range of your systems. Oh, okay. So, so right now it, it's dependent on the elevation, how high we can get it. But um, this is a, a an image showing five miles. Yeah. How how far we'd be able to see with uh, a radar on, on, on the pier in Nome. So six, six miles up and down the coast, basically, um, which, which would cover the area shown in this map. So, so obviously no, nowhere near um, the Diomedes. If we had one in, on Little Diomede and we had one in Wales, uh, they probably wouldn't overlap unless we could get them pretty high up off the, gotcha. off, off above sea level. Okay. 
Okay. Thanks, Dean. Any other questions? I, I've got a couple I'm going to ask. No one else. Oh, there's a thought in the chat. There's my mouse. Thinking about SAR applications, are there things people stuck on the ice on the ice that they could do to increase reflectivity and be detected by radar? Um, yeah, that's actually a, a good idea. Um, uh, you could use a transponder like Dean just mentioned um, or an artificial reflector like you, you can buy them for, for putting on your sailboat to make your sailboat brighter in someone else's radar. Um, so, so they could help. Or um, there are ways that we could add an antenna to the radar, and this is something to discuss particularly for the GNOME radar, that would give it um, AIS capability. And then that's the automatic identification system for any mariners out there. It's a way you, you, you put a, a VHF transmitter on your boat and it talks to a station on the land and it reports the, the position of the boat. Um, we and, have and this several, is how vessel traffic is, is, is tracked. Uh, we the have Alaska several AIS is, towers in Nome, if that helps you. Oh, Yours so, would be great yeah, to so even get another already one. AIS towers in Nome, we might be able to tap into that. And then that way, uh, those positions can be displayed directly on, on the radar image. Also, don't forget to use your cell phone if you're within range. That's <laughs> yeah. usually the uh, method now, but um, it is a serious consideration. So people shouldn't uh, be too far out if the ice is bad. And that actually brings me to, you know, one of the things you might want, you were talking about your flickering. I have mm -hmm. no idea about the ice of the Beaufort Sea. And it sounds like you've done quite a bit uh, of work up there. But here, you know, I have been trained as soon as you're at on the ice, there's a lot of different things you learn, but one of them to be safe is that if you're crabbing or ice fishing and you watch the water start to, you know, your word flickering, mm -hmm. you watch the water go up and down. I suppose that's you going up and down, but you watch the water in the hole. And as soon as that starts to move, it will just start to go. And you know to pick it up and leave immediately. So, you know, there are local knowledge um, that might be useful to you uh, in understanding what signals people use to make sure they're safe and that why we don't have a lot of SAR uh, instances where everybody's doing things on the ice in the Bering Strait region. Again, I wouldn't dare to speak about Beaufort Sea, but we're very different than Beaufort Sea. And um, I don't know if that's ever been brought to your attention or those are the kinds of things you're asking people. Um, th that sort of local knowledge is just absolutely priceless for, for helping us understand what we're seeing in the image and, and understanding what we know to look for so that we can then uh, perhaps start to, to better design warning systems. And it certainly sounds like that's the sort of process we think causes the flickering. The ice is moving, and it might only be a little bit, but sometimes the radar can be really sensitive to just a little motion of the ice. And, and I think that's the sort of signal that we're picking up. Rob Kaler asks, are there any health concerns for those working around the radar? Good question. That, that, that's a great question. There are minimum safe working distances. Uh, and while the radar is, is running, you, you need to sort of, uh, if, if you're below the radar, you're, you're fine. But if you're at the elevation of the radar, so if you're up at the same height as the light pole, um, I will need to look this up to get the exact number, but I believe it's about 30 feet is, is the, 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 the safe working distance if you're up in the beam of the radar. But down on the ground, um, uh, you, 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 you can be right up against the, the light pole and uh, there's, there's, there's no, no safety concerns there at all. All right, that's good to know. Good to know. And you know, unlike up north, you'll be able to, we'll be able to see ships in the dark. So I think that'll be of interest to people, which makes me think that you will have a public site or there must be a public site for the people in the Utkiagvik, um, 
And I don't know if you can drop in the chat, maybe your site for Utkiagvik, because people here might be interested. And I don't know if you're going to have a separate GNOME site, but I would I would assume you are because you uh, must have something. Yeah, so um, I'll go that back we to the all be slide nosy that and poke in on and take a look. The um, so at the moment that's the uh, the URL for the the Okiagvik CS radar. And when of course when we did when we first had this data online, Okiagvik was still called Barrow, and so that's why the URL we need we need to update the URL. Um, but the one for GNOME will be exactly the same. Only instead of Barrow, it will say GNOME. Okay, great. And thank you, Rick. Just dropped it in the chat for you, which is very nice. And if you're really lucky, you might, Andy, you might want to ask Rick Toman if he would, uh, because this is sea ice and this is Bering Strait. Rick Toman has a very popular um, Facebook site here in the Bering Strait region that he does all things climate and weather and ice on. And so I would ask really nicely if Rick might advertise your um, gnome radar on through his site as well. Yeah, Andy, I was just thinking if you could if you could put up a short animation uh, with a little explanation um, that that would give exposure to um, you know people throughout the region to what this looks like and might spur some some thought of like, oh, maybe maybe we could use something like this um, in our community. So it would just be a way of, of getting the word out if that's something you want to do. Just a short little clip and some, some you know, explanation of what people are looking at. Absolutely, I can definitely uh, do that. And, and that would be really valuable. Thank, thanks for the offer, Rick. The, the, the another comment, are you doing okay, Andy? You're, you're... And I'm, I'm doing okay now, questions. yeah. Okay, a lot of interest in, in your mechanism here coming to town. The slide of Gnome's port had a note that said the sweep can be turned off as it crosses land. Now, mind you, there are people that live on a hill uh, right up from the port, um, if I understood correctly. Just curious why that option, is there safety or privacy type concerns? Um, yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Um, I put that in primarily for, for, for privacy, uh, just in case people didn't were, were uncomfortable with the idea that this radar can track wildlife or it can track vehicles and, and things like that. So we have the option. The other reason uh, is if I go to this slide, you can actually see that behind the light pole where we're planning to put the radar, behind the wooden light pole, there's a taller metal light pole. And so we're actually going to have to turn the radar off when it's pointing at that light pole. Otherwise, it'll um, it, it'll kind of mess with, with, with the signal for not just when it's pointing at that light pole, but for actually for quite a bit of time after it's looked in that direction. It kind of like, um, it's kind of like getting a really bright light shot in your eyes, and then you can't see anything for a while. That, that's what would happen if, if the radar looked at that, that light pole, and we didn't turn it off when it was looking at that light pole. All right, thank you for answering that one. Um, now we have had in, in talks past Seth Danielson with UAF College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences, and he's doing high frequency radar, both at Shishmaref and at Wales. Are you are you guys talking? Um, yes, yes, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm fairly familiar with with Seth's HF radar. Um, okay. This this works under. Uh, they're both they're both radar in the way that they're radio detection and ranging. Uh, but the, the physics behind them is, is, is quite different um, and, and the processes that they're able to observe are also quite different. So Seth's radars are designed to uh, measure the speed of the ocean surface. So, they, so these actually bounce off of waves on the surface and uh, you can measure how fast that wave is moving when, when the radar energy bounces off of it. Uh, the radar we're using doesn't have that ability to, to measure the speed of an object directly from one signal. We have to watch that object over several minutes or so on to get its speed. It works in a different way. Um, Seth's radar 
doesn't work over ice and our radar doesn't work so well on waves. So, so they're actually kind of mutually, uh, there's not a lot of overlap between when they're both seeing the same thing. Okay. I was just thinking maybe you can talk with Native Village of Wales and Native Village of Shishmaref and Seth and see if mm -hmm. um, you were looking for places. And I saw that Shishmaref and Wales were on your potential list, which leads Absolutely. to my overall question. And I may have missed it in the beginning, but what is the ultimate goal that you're hoping to achieve? Because it sounds like you're wanting to put radar in quite a variety of places. So it made me think, well, number one, we do have some geopolitical situations this year in particular that may make it more attractive or less attractive to certain areas in the Bering Strait region to have uh, something like that. I don't know. But um, what is the main objective of doing your work in Utqiagvik and then picking known? What, what made us, what's the... Um, well, there's, so there's a few things. I think okay. some is just uh, the, 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 the basic research aspect of it. Uh, I am a novice about sea ice conditions uh, in the Bering Sea. And I think I, I know how useful radars can be, coastal radars for, for understanding uh, coastal sea ice conditions. I think it's one of the best tools that, that we have in our toolkit so it's natural if I want to set, understand a new region, uh, radar is going to be one of my, my first choices to do that. Um, at the same time, we know that uh, the radar data are not just useful scientifically. Um, a lot of people in, in Okiagvik watch the radar regularly and then try partly to watch the ice go by, as, as the title slide said. Um, and watch how it develops, uh, because they're going to be going out on that ice to, 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 to go whaling. Uh, and they're going to, when the ice breaks up, they're going to be going out boating. Um, so we know it, it serves a community service and a scientific purpose. Um, I mentioned on the, the final slide that this project is actually funded by the Department of the Army. Um, and, and their interest is still basic research. But what I think is, is, is recognized is that uh, the ice covered coastal environment is not a region with which the Department of, of the Army has a lot of uh, knowledge or expertise. And I, it, it, we, we, we made no geopolitical arguments at the time, but, but I suspect um, the current geopolitical state of the Arctic means that maybe people in the Department of Defense are starting to think about their knowledge gaps in, uh, in, in, in the Arctic and how one moves men, uh, people and materials uh, across the landscape it may, may become an, an important question. And this is part of our uh, attempt to just understand the, the landscape better from, uh, from a whole range of different perspectives. Thank you. I can guarantee there are people asking those questions um, currently. But um, is, so did the army want you to come down here or was this your choice? Um, we put forward a number of options uh, um, and, and Nome was one of them. The, the other thing that makes Nome uh, a great location is the logistics of uh, getting to Nome and, and, and the facilities and infrastructure that are at Nome. Um, on, uh, on this slide, um, I say that all the radar needs is electrical power, internet access, and, and some elevation above sea level. Uh, but an airport that's served by a jet once or twice a day is also really helpful. Um, these radars are pretty reliable. They're you know designed to be mounted on ships and have storms and waves thrown at them. But they do take maintenance when you're operating them 24 hours a day. And uh, somewhere like Nome, is, is uh, I think makes it a bit more favorable place to operate a radar and keep it operating um, than some more remote communities. Now that's not to say we don't want to go to remote communities, but um, when we are sort of learn to walk before you can run, we thought, okay, for our second location, let, let's pick somewhere else that um, uh, just has a bit more infrastructure so that we can learn a bit more about operating in a new environment before we make it more difficult for ourselves by, by going to a more remote location. All right. Well, thank you so much. Any other questions for 
Andy Mahoney regarding our sea ice. We will look forward to seeing if you guys are coming and putting it in by the end of June, when should we um, expect to be able to be nosing in on a website? Um, well, I'm hoping that we'll get the physical hardware installed around mid-June, and then I'm expecting at least a couple of weeks before uh, we've got all of the data flow and, and software running to where we can actually put up a public website. So that's why I'm hoping uh, we'll have publicly available data, I'm hoping by the end of June. And I have an AIS antenna I want to talk to you about. I want to get it up higher, so maybe we can put it on your poll. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. Um, with that, if there's no more questions, thank you everybody for putting in a little love there for uh, Andy Mahoney and people are excited for the radar. Um, next week, and you're even getting some claps. Wow, good job, Rob. Um, we will have Straight Science on a Thursday, back to the Thursday schedule. Next week, we have Rob Keeler and Andy Ramey, who will be talking to us about the seabird die-offs, as well as the update, an update on the avian influenza situation in birds in Alaska. So do not miss next Thursday. So that will be the night of the 26th at 6.30. And we have, we already have lots of questions. <laughs> so, and concerns and things like that. So that will be that for next week and for straight science. And again, Andy, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who tuned in tonight. Wow, we're going to, we learned something new here. Um, I did. And I can't wait to see if we can get that AIS uh, receiver up that pole too. So you can have a one, we can have a one, two punch as to what is out there, ice wise and ship wise. So with that, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>